recommended uh, to this group by Fran Griffin, who was the publisher of Sobrin's. You might know Sobrin was here a couple times back, oh uh, gosh, two, 2003 and again in 2006, going back many years, and he passed, of course, in 2010. And uh, Fran said, you have to get Dr. Godfrey to come and speak. Uh, he is uh, uh, very anti-communist, and uh, he is going to, we titled the speech today, The Spirit of 17, and you know, what it really boils down to, as he pointed out when we spoke on the phone last year even, is that, you know, the communist threat was very real and it was an external threat, but the threat that we face here is, uh, is a form of cultural Marxism, and it's it's internal. It's an internal threat, and it's a it's a, uh, a kind of a virus that has spread through the institutions and has destroyed the fabric of our country. And as he's pointed out at the moment, it seems to be rather unstoppable. I mean, what haven't they taken? They, even even the Boy Scouts they took, which lasted longer than the Evangelical Church. We give them credit for that, but they took it. Uh, they own the Boy Scouts now too. So what's left? Uh, I don't know. But we're going to have to figure out what we can do in response, and hopefully he'll give us some ideas today because we are in trouble. And uh, as much as you might like Donald Trump, the one guy's not necessarily going to pull us out of this mess. So, and uh, that's the way he wants to. <laughs> hopefully he does. So Dr. Godfrey uh, is a uh, former professor from right here in uh, at Michigan State University, believe it or not. He taught for a year in 1967 at Michigan State. Uh, last night when I picked him up from the airport, I drove him through East Lansing so he could take a look at the old uh, <laughs> stomping ground there. And uh, a lot of new buildings. I personally hadn't been there since 1967 myself. <laughs> so I was just as surprised as you, right? The new buildings and everything there. I did make one quick visit in 1990. It was a daring rescue of my wife who grew up in East Lansing. We pulled her out of there, got her out, and never went back. <laughs> so she's here today, by the way, at the back table. Um, he has written so many books. They're on your postcard. I don't even, I don't think we want to say them all. It would take too much more time. I've already wasted enough of his time. So, but one of his books is here this morning. He's got other ones on the table that we don't have a lot of that he is uh, that you can look at afterwards and discuss things with him. This particular book here, War and Democracy, is going to be available uh, if you can make a donation today to this event. And uh, we've got only about ten of these, I think. Is that right? Um, my wife removed eight because she was afraid I was carrying too much. But I will send you some <laughs> through the mail. How many do we have? Um, I think we only had these two. Okay, so the price really went up. For the <laughs> but I, 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 I can send you about 10, 20, it's not a problem. Well, we'll do, we're horrible at follow-up mail or whatever, but I promise you this, if, we, if, you, uh, if you get involved and help us out in that way, we will have them here at the next conference with your name on it. Right. So, and that's gonna be, take the opportunity to tell you when that is, April 25, if you wanna make a note of that. It's April 25. We have all the dates booked all the way until the fall of, uh, of uh, at the spring of 2022, I believe all the dates are already, I don't know them all, but I know the spring one is April 25. So uh, with that, uh, let me introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Yeah. Paul Godfrey. Yeah. Oh. I have to say that man's adoption is beautiful. <laughs> you have one, right? I have had dachshunds my entire life, and most of them in black and tan, like the one that he's carrying. <laughs> there you go. Right. Okay. All right, Dr. Paul Godfrey. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was, I was going to mention I have a, a dachshund that has uh, survived all of the travails of age, uh, uh, Minna, and she's now 17 and a half. Uh, and is totally senile. She wanders around the house just barking. Uh, you have to give her some kind of narcotic to quiet her down. Uh, but we continue to, uh, to look after her because we are such uh, uh, passionate dog lovers. Uh, as is this gentleman who brought the, the dog with him. Oh, gee, it's a gorgeous dog. Okay, the, uh, I, I have some connections with the state of Michigan, and I, I think I mentioned it yesterday to John that um, I used to live over on Bertram Drive for one year when I taught at Michigan State. It was my 
uh, my first teaching job after I obtained my PhD from Yale, uh, I, I took it with the mistaken impression that I'd be teaching history or Greek or something like that. I landed up having to teach a kind of general college course uh, to people who had no interest in studying. And, uh, you know, we had, we had to use these textbooks which consisted of several lines from, from various, from maybe from St. Paul or from Kant or uh, Shakespeare. Um, and it, it became very, very tiresome. And after a year, I was delighted that I was offered a job at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. But the, uh, I, I really did like East Lansing. Uh, uh, two of my daughters uh, went to the University of Michigan as a Michigan shirt. Uh, and uh, I, although I have not visited Lansing, when we lived in Rockford, we took uh, our daughters up to Interlochen. So we drove along the west coast, right, of your uh, lovely state, but through Benton Harbor up to Ludington and then uh, toward Traverse City. So I do have uh, quite, I've also been in the Upper Peninsula several times. Um, so I, I know something, something about your state, and I'm not entirely a stranger. Uh, I have some of my books here, uh, th except for Encounters, which is an autobiography that I wrote about 10 years ago. Most, most of these books are related to the theme of today's, where's the dog, I don't see it. <laughs> here, okay. Uh, related to the, to the theme of, of uh, today's lecture. Uh, and this is the development of what I call the post-Marxist left. You see? And I have a book here called The Strange Death of Marxism, uh, which it is, it sort of previews uh, uh, a theme that I've been working on for about the last 20 years. And this is uh, to understand fully the distinction between traditional Marxism, or Marxist-Leninism, uh, as it came to be known in the Soviet Union and other countries that claimed to have had communist revolutions, uh, and what is today the left. Um, and I, I think John said that I was, I'm anti-communist. I was anti-communist when I thought it was relevant. <laughs> um, I don't think it's relevant anymore. Uh, I think we face a much more insidious, dangerous leftist threat, and it's largely internal. Uh, and uh, the, the threat that we face, uh, as, as I've argued in books and articles, which have made me very unpopular in the official conservative movement, it pervades the so-called conservative movement as thoroughly as it does anything on the left. Um, I, I was watching Tucker Carlson uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and I noticed he had a, uh, a proud homosexual conservative, followed by a transgendered Republican the next day. Th then he had a, uh, anybody's name, Tammy Bruce, is a lesbian second wave feminist. Now, these are the acceptable, indeed the paradigmatic conservatives in our time, right? Um, because they're not going to, they, the hope is they will not offend the left. Because they'll be enough like the left in terms of their lifestyle, uh, so that, uh, you, you know, that, that the left will let them pass as conservatives or Republicans, but by now the labels have become uh, uh, totally meaningless. I mean, there's something almost cynical you know, to describe people like this as, as conservative, by, by, by any definition. Um, you know, have, having grown up uh, in the 1950s, I couldn't imagine people like this even being part of the political spectrum. Uh, and it was, it was looking at the changes that have occurred in American society, uh, I think sort of starting in the 1990s, that led me first to write a trilogy, uh, which was on the managerial state um, as an instrument of social engineering called after liberalism. Liberalism in my book means 19th century liberalism. It does not mean the stuff you see on CNN uh, today. Uh, the second volume was on multiculturalism, and the third volume was on the strange death of Marxism. I did a book on fascism, now I'm doing a book on anti-fascism. And I noticed that in all of these books, I'm dealing with the same thing, uh, which is the development of a post-Marxist left. Now, uh, some people might, might uh, retort that, well, this, there are elements of Marxism here, you know, about cultural Marxism. Uh, and in fact, one of my teachers, Herbert Marcuse, was a cultural Marxist. In fact, perhaps the two longest living uh, prize students of uh, Marcuse were Angela Davis and myself. 
uh, and I couldn't imagine people who would disagree, <laughs> or except, except we both had a certain high regard for, for, for Marcuse. I also wrote for many years for Telos magazine, which had some kind of uh, Frankfurt School roots, although it sort of went beyond that and became very critical of managerial government. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've met uh, people representing the Frankfurt School. I speak, speak and write fluent German, so you know that's, that's not a problem for me. Um, uh, I've also met French cultural other, other, others, and uh, to me, in many ways, cultural Marxism is important as a transition to what we have now. It is, well, it is not the final stage, because I think the Frankfurt School in Germany and the interwar period is relatively conservative to what we're seeing now. Uh, for instance, they considered homosexuality to be aberrant pathological behavior. They wanted to tolerate these people, but never do they recommend uh, that people be gay. Uh, they still did not believe in gay marriage, unlike people I hear on Fox News who think it's a great thing, and President Trump who thinks it's wonderful. Um, uh, they had some, still had some notion of traditional gender rules. Um, but then you have to remember they're living like in the 1920s in Germany. Uh, they're not living in the United States in 2019 or in Germany in 2000, which is much more radical, uh, much more radically anti-fascist and, you know, for <coughs> want a better term, cultural Marxist uh, than we are in the United States because they were brainwashed to be this way you know, after World War II. So um, uh, the, the, uh, the so-called cultural Marxists, by our standards, are not particularly radical. Um, but why they are important, in, 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 in my view, is A, they do prepare the groundwork for what we see now. And from the 1930s on, they leave Germany. Many of them are Jewish or part Jewish, so they have to get out. And they come to the United States and they settle in, in, in Columbia University in New York, Morningside Heights. And uh, many of them become practicing psychoanalysts, psychologists, pop psychologists, social psychologists like Eric Fromm. Um, and, you know, Americans read them, and they also have profound influence on the American government uh, that from the 19, late 1940s on, and, th and this is during McCarthyism, I want you to know, because this, I think, think this is a viciously reactionary, go no, it was not. Uh, people who worked for the government were given examinations on what they called the F scale, the fascist scale, you know, and this was designed by Frankfurt School sort of Marxist, I mean, they, they, they were generally pro-communist, you know, but they were not orthodox Marxists because it was so mixed in with Freudianism and all kinds of weird sex theories and so forth that, uh, you know, it, it would be a disservice to Marxists to call them, you know, regular orthodox Marxists. And, and the Marxists disavow them, the communists disavow them, but they had a tremendous influence on America. And uh, they influenced public administration uh, the, uh, the, the work uh, that they published on the authoritarian personality in 1950 has a tremendous effect, you know, on American social science. Uh, sociologists read this stuff, government workers, and then it's interesting that Seymour Morton Lipset, who is like the most famous or the most important sociologist in the United States, recognized, um, loved the front, I thought the authoritarian personality was a great work, and that we really have to be careful about people who are who are fascists but don't really reveal it. We have to sort of, you know, examine their attitudes. Like if they go to church, that's, you know, they're sort of on their way. If they make gender distinctions, the gender distinctions I think were still accepted. That you were supposed to treat uh, women like men or equally or something like this. If if you, uh, for instance, if you say I don't think I think women's primary place should be in the home, that would that would be an indication that you might have an incipient fascist personality. But they, they use this, you know, to, uh, to test government workers. During the McCarthy era, this went on. You know, they're the so-called reactionary uh, 1950s with our red, supposed red terror and everything. This was going on in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and of course, as many of uh, Americans who do not know, the House and American Activity Committee did not begin when they went after su uh, suspected communists. For eight or nine years earlier, they're going after suspected fascists, right, from the late 1930s on. It was only when they turned against the left that all these people began screaming about civil liberties. Uh, the civil liberties have been taken away long before. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, 
Uh, I, I think we, one has to understand that what, what is called cultural Marxism is different from regular Marxism. Uh, it, it focuses on overcoming bourgeois repression, sexual repression, which is linked to things like uh, gender stereotyping, homophobia, um, uh, and excessive concern about a communist menace. Because they were always soft on the communists. I mean, this is one thing that's clear. And uh, I remember my own teacher, Herbert Marcuse, defending the Soviets' suppression of the Hungarian uprising in 1956. You know, so they, they're, they're always, in some way, they saw the Soviet Union as a society in the future, you know, even though they killed tens of millions of people there. But it was, it was sort of like moving in the right direction. Um, uh, but they, they were not as radical as the, uh, we now call the intersectional left, uh, or what I call the post-Marxist left, which I think in many ways represents uh, an intensification of all the radical elements of, of cultural Marxism uh, of the 1940s, 1930s, uh, into the 1950s. Um, I, I think it is fair, however, for me to point out that there are overlaps between traditional Marxism and the post-Marxist left. They're both anti-fascist. Of course, they define fascism differently. So I'm showing my book on anti-fascism. For the communists, fascists were a capitalist monopoly. Right? They were capitalists who were uh, going through a period of crisis. They were afraid of revolution, so they created a, a counter-revolution. So fascism is capitalist counter-revolution. For the cultural Marxist and now the post-Marxist left, uh, fascism is about gender stereotyping, homophobia, uh, you guessed it, you know, all, 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 the, all the stuff that we hear attacked on CNN and occasionally even on Fox. Uh, the, 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 these are the signs of fascism that we have to be on guard against. Uh, both uh, the communist uh, and the post-Marxist left favor a very large government engaging in massive social engineering to overcome either capitalism, capitalism and or uh, gender stereotyping, homophobia, Christianity, all the things they want to get rid of, right? So they, they both favor very, very powerful states and an end to what we consider bourgeois civilization, like people living in nuclear family, although, although the communists in practice aren't quite that radical, um, which is, I think, a problem for the, for the post-Marxist left because they continue to admire the communists. They're still soft on the communists, you know. Uh, you, 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 remember Barack Obama ran to Cuba, right? And he spent like two days kissing up, you know, to some mass murderer there. Why? Because being nice to communists is part of his leftist identity. Even though Castro sticks homosexuals into concentration camps. But that doesn't matter for, you know, the homosexual activist, Barack Obama. Uh, the same Mark Bray, who wrote the, the Antifa book, uh, handbook, praises Stalin throughout his book. Now, he's for gay rights, feminism, the whole nine yards. Why does he like Stalin? Well, he was a communist, and communists were radical, and we're radicals. So they, they do continue to see the communists as their antecedents in some sense. I mean, they, they continue to be soft on the communists the way you know, my colleagues at Michigan State were when I was here, uh, and most academics have always been uh, throughout my lifetime. They were soft on the communists, even, even if, you know, even if these people have moved beyond Marxist-Leninism into some other form of madness, but they still continue to uh, be enamored of the communist experiment. They see in this a kind of precedent for what they're doing. Social engineering, destroying traditional religion, uh, supposedly liberating women, although communists didn't really do very much of that. So th th this, this, this is not, an, another obvious um, uh, similarity is that the communist and the post-Marxist left both believe that human beings are totally malleable. Not only they're malleable, but they can keep reinventing themselves. At least, at least in the cultural Marxist, I don't want to use that word, but the, the post-Marxist left. You know, you can be a man one minute, a woman, something in between, you can use this restroom. Uh, th this is an, an exaggerated, almost bizarre form of traditional communist idea that people can be 
molded, remolded. And of course, Marx himself, in his, in his young writing, in his writings, his youthful writings, uh, uh, talks about how human beings are alienated from their true selves. Only when we overcome capitalism can we discover what we really are. Because we're, you know, we're alienated. So this idea that we're alienated and have to discover who we really are. And the state will help us to do this. And it will punish people who stand in our way, right? Like, you know, if you deny the man who says he's a woman the right to use the transgender bathroom, the woman's restroom or something, you're, uh, you're committing a hate crime. Um, communists never talk about hate crimes. It is, again, this is uh, uh, post-Marxist left talk. Communists will talk about reactionaries or capitalists or running dogs of capitalism or fascism or something. Uh, that they, they have more uh, more sensible uh, epithets to use against their enemy, but now now everything's a hate crime or a hate speech or something. But what you're doing, in a sense, is you're denying another human being the right to discover his or her or its true self. So the, 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 this idea of malleability, people reinventing themselves, is another common feature uh, that is shared by the Marxist. Um, and by the post-Marxist left. Uh, now, what, what, I, what I've argued is that this post-Marxist left finds a true home in the United States. Uh, it is uh, contrary to what you read. I mean, as Alan Bloom wrote this book, The uh, Closing of the American Mind, in which he argues that German ideas corrupted Americans or something. No, uh, it is the Americans that re-educated the Germans after World War II. And there were certain German ideas we brought here, uh, which were, you know, the cultural Marxist ideas, which, which the Germans largely rejected. Then we went back and re-educated them and sent these people back, and we did, you know, and then they became even more radical than the, than the Americans. But, <clears throat> but the the, uh, the Frankfurt School found a home in the United States. This became its primary home when they came here in the 30s, 40s, when they were in the 50s. Many made careers in the United States. <clears throat> and then uh, when the, uh, the Americans occupy Germany after World War II, they create a, uh, uh, at the University of Frankfurt, they create the, um, uh, the Institut für Sozial Forschung, which they already had here, Institute for Social uh, Research, which they brought back over there, and they sent back, you know, uh, Theodor Adorno, Max Horkheim, with the leaders, you know, of the Frankfurt School in exile, they sent them back to Germany. So, you know, by then it had become really an American export. Uh, <clears throat> also, you know, if, if you go to Europe, you find that uh, most of the books in these bookstores are American books in translation. In France, Germany, Italy, Spain, I've gone to all these countries. You see American books. I was in Hungary, I saw these American books, although they don't read quite as many. And, you know, they, they represent the same point of view as, you know, your kids uh, are given in American universities or that you get you know, from the American media. Uh, but even, they're even more extreme. And these are the books that are read in Europe. Um, Europeans are much less influenced by Americans than America. Uh, um, Europeans are more influenced by Americans than Americans are influenced by Europeans. I mean, there's just no comparison, <clears throat> right? Um, I mean, China might be you know, the second greatest industrial power. Um, they have a lot of people in China. The question is, outside of China, how many people read Chinese books? Uh, probably not that many, right? Um, the Soviet Union didn't do very didn't do a very good job exporting its stuff. I mean, you went to some kind of you know uh, people's friendship bookstore in Greenwich Village, you know, and you picked this this. Or, the, the only Russian stuff that was read was were, were Russian opponents of the regime, right? Like Pasternak and Solzhenitsyn. I mean, those were the people that we read here. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> we certainly did not. You know, read so read, read very much Soviet literature. So I, I think I think that, that this <clears throat> difference people do read American authors. They have profound influence on Europe. So uh, <clears throat> to the, uh, also you know everything we do here has a profound influence on Europe. Even people who claim to hate the United States, um, if they're on the left, they're Americans because they've taken over our ideas. So America, you know, as as one English conservative said, is the paradise of the world's left. You know, it's it's our ideas, um, our pathologies, you know, which they which they run to embrace while claiming to be anti-American. <clears throat> and very often you ask, you know, why are you anti-American? Yeah. Well, Americans uh, don't do enough for gays, or Americans don't have enough transgender facilities or something. 
They always let, or America doesn't have socialized medicine yet. <clears throat> but the, the, re, the reasons that they are anti-American uh, typically suggest, except in the case of the socialized medicine, a, a very strong American influence. I mean, they, they're, they're very much uh, imprinted by what we do here. <clears throat> so I, I, I think we see as the, as the expansion of political correctness across Europe, uh, you cannot rule out the American factor. It all did start in the United States. I mean, Europe has anti, had anti-colonialism after the settlement of the French. Uh, the United States has anti-racism, right? Uh, the United States exported anti-anti-Semitism, uh, all these other things we exported to the Europeans. Uh, and, you know, I mean, things they may have arrived at by, on their own, uh, but which we, we certainly helped to give them. Uh, what, one of the proofs of the pudding is go to Eastern Europe. Why, why aren't these places as radical as, the, as Western Europe? And the answer is they lived under the Soviets. And the Soviets had, <clears throat> for, for all their brutality, a much more conservative regime than ours. <clears throat> right? I mean, they would not have put up with gay bathrooms, gay this. Uh, for the most part, they had traditional gender roles. The women, they had one, women working because they, their productivity was so low. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but communist societies were not socially radical. Um, you know, books that I've read about East German society suggest in many ways it was very conservative. In, in, order, to, in order to maintain its identity as a German state, uh, it played to all kinds of nationalism. So what, what, what you had in uh, East Germany uh, was a, um, an attempt to glorify Frederick the Great, uh, Martin Luther, uh, Bismarck. These are all great East German heroes. You know, they, they, they's honoring them. Uh, these people are seen as villains, uh, you know, proto-fascist or something in West Germany. The only good people are the communists, the gays, uh, the anti-German, the anti-fascists, and so forth. But, uh, but the communist societies were in some ways profoundly conservative. <clears throat> um, I mean, I wouldn't care to live in them. You didn't, there were very few freedoms. Uh, the standard of living was abysmal. I mean, <laughs> I've been in them. <clears throat> but they were certainly were, were not culturally radical societies. And I think that that's a significant difference. Uh, <clears throat> between the, between uh, you know Western countries that have been influenced by Amer American liberalism, what we now call liberalism, and Eastern European countries. I mean, uh, someone like Orban in Hungary, who's like a very conservative leader, would be inconceivable as the head of a government of Western Europe. <clears throat> so, so we really are dealing with um, uh, with an American influence on Europe, and I, I think it's undeniably present in terms of what they read, the authors who are popular. Uh, and it is almost impossible for me to uh, separate the spread of what I call the post-Marxist left <clears throat> without, uh, uh, without looking at the uh, American influence. Uh, by the way, the influence is greatest in Anglophone countries because they speak English. Go to Canada is an advanced model of American PC multiculturalism. Right? It's an advanced model. It's worse than we are. Australia, they're all New Zealand. They're all like that. England. Right? And I, I think in all these cases, we're looking you know, at people who are studying American books, uh, being influenced by, by American culture. Uh, so th 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 this, I, this, I think, yeah, I, I would also argue uh, that in order to overcome this legacy, it has to start here. Because Europeans, in the end of the day, are going to do what we do. And do what? The, the Europeans will do what we do. They'll be influenced by our ideas. Okay. Now, Europeans think I'm being very condescending because you know they started gay rights, or they were the first to have transgendered bathrooms or to fight racism. And what I'm saying is that without the American occupation of Germany after World War II, without American influence in Western Europe, <clears throat> without the predominance of American popular culture <coughs> and American literate culture, books and things we write, uh, on Europe, you would not have multiculturalism there. Uh, the, and the people, of course, in all these countries who are, uh, as a class, perhaps most influenced a after academics are government workers. I mean, does anybody, if, if you were to go over here to Lansing and speak to administrators, d does anyone doubt that most of them have the same political views, which would not be our political view, <laughs> exactly the opposite, right? <clears throat> and this seems to be the, I mean, it's, it's something like, 97, 98% you know, of 
administrators in government, at all levels, are politically on the left. And this is even more so in Europe. And you, 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 just, you mean nothing but leftist administrators. <clears throat> and considering how much power the modern state has, public administration has, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, this is a powerful instrument uh, for indoctrinating people and also scaring them uh, into, into, into obedience uh, to political correctness. Uh, uh, 